Well, good evening. We welcome you to our study this evening. Uh, we are studying in the book of 1 Samuel. We're ready to start the book of 1 Samuel, so it'll be a, a new book tonight. Uh, same workbook, but new book in the Bible. Uh, we'll begin with a word of prayer. Father, we're thankful for all that you've given us and all you do for us. And Father, we're mindful of so many that are sick and those that have had surgery and those that have taken treatments and those that are handling problems and depression in their lives. And we just pray, Lord, that you'll be with each one and give them healing and peace and comfort and help us, Father, to be mindful of others and to do what we can to be an encouragement. Father, we pray that you'll be with us as a church here at Ephesus, that we can reach out to this community and that we can study with those that are willing to study with us, that we can reach those that are lost and bring them to Jesus Christ. We pray, Father, for the men that we support in other places, and we pray that they will be fruitful in their work and that they can bring souls to you in each place where they're working. Be with us in our study this evening, we pray in Jesus Christ. Amen. He begins in the book uh, just with an overview very quickly of saying that there are four main characters in the book of 1 Samuel, which he says was originally 1 and 2 Samuel were one book, and 1 and 2 Kings were one book. And so you had... Uh, 1 Kings and 2 Kings, which consisted of 1 and 2 Samuel, 1 and 2 Kings. Uh, I don't know that I had ever read that before. I'm not sure where he came up with that, but that's okay. Uh, but anyway, that's what he says in the book. Uh, he says there's four main characters in the book. Uh, of course, we begin with Eli, who is a priest and a judge. Uh, and he is the 14th of the judges and so this book really just picks up right where the end of the judges not the last chapter of the book of judges but where the end of the judges uh, was uh, which was Samson and then Eli is the next judge uh, and then the next judge after Eli who was both a priest and a judge and seemingly although he's not referred to as a high priest it seems to me that he may be the high priest at that time. I'm not sure. Uh, but uh, Samuel is the next uh, judge, and he is the last of the 15 judges. And so we study Eli, and then we study Samuel. Samuel is not referred to as a Nazarite, but based on uh, what he is said, I think he probably was uh, from birth. Uh, and uh, then after Samuel, uh, and after his life, then Saul becomes king as the first king of Israel. And then David uh, becomes king after Saul. So these are the four men that we will study about in, in the book. Uh, he, he draws some pretty stark contrast between them and uh, while seemingly there's no question that David probably would be the outstanding one and Samuel would be right close to him, that Saul and Eli seem to have more issues, uh, although there are flaws in all of them. And in fact, the biggest flaw with Eli, Samuel also had, and that was the lack of restraining his sons and having sons who were, were leading the people astray and, and being wicked themselves. So uh, I think that's, uh, I think that what that tells you is that some of the best people in the world have flaws. Some of the worst people in the world have some good, good attributes. Uh, and so you have, you know, everybody has some good and some bad. But uh, these four characters are the ones that we will study about. The book begins, uh, and it's sort of interesting uh, the way it begins because it, re, it says that there was a man named Elkanah who lived uh, in the hill country of Ephraim. And verse 1 says he was an Ephraimite, which makes you think that he is from the tribe of Ephraim. However, uh, later in, in this uh, 
and I don't remember now where it was, but later on he references a passage over in the book of First Chronicles, uh, and in that passage it gives us the genealogy of Samuel, genealogy of Samuel, uh, and Samuel is actually a Levite from the family of Kohath. Uh, so he he is actually a Levite. Now, that raises a question then, why is he referred to as an Ephraimite if he is a Levite? Anybody got an explanation? Do you know what his hometown was? It's where... Elkanah's hometown. It is, it is later Samuel's hometown. When Samuel is a judge, it, he, he went back to this place and he, it's his hometown too. Mm -mm. I was, do what? No, it was Ramah. Ramah. Now Ramah, if you go back to the conquering of the land of Canaan, Ramah is one of the cities that was given to the Levites that was in the land of Ephraim. So I think what, what's going on here is he lived in the land of Ephraim in the city of Ramah, which was the city of the Levites, but he is referred to as an Ephraimite because that's where he lived in the country of Ephraim. Uh, however, and this is all, and I didn't, I've never known this till when I started studying for this lesson. Uh, I'd never seen the, that genealogy over there in First Chronicles uh, that I know of. If, if I had it, it didn't stay with me. Uh, but when I saw that and I see that he is a Levite, this explains to me, and there's some issues about this even that we'll talk about later, uh, it explains to me why Samuel so many different times offered up sacrifices. And, and I've heard people question the fact that Samuel offered up a sacrifice and he was an Ephraimite and, you know, and that wouldn't have been acceptable. And why would he have been the one to offer up sacrifices for the people, which he did on many different occasions. Uh, and you remember when he rebukes King Saul for so badly before he goes to battle because he told Saul to wait on him until he got there and he'd offer up a sacrifice and Saul offered up the sacrifice. And I had wondered, well, what difference did it make? Neither one of them were Levites, but Samuel is a Levite. So that would, that would explain a whole lot of things about the life of Samuel. And I don't know why or how I've managed to get to this point in my life in Bible study that I didn't realize that before, but it just goes to show you, you keep learning no matter where you are. Uh, as, you, as we get older, we keep learning. But anyway, he is from the city of Ramah. And so we'll see later uh, at, in chapter 7, uh, when he's judging, it says it lists some of the cities that he was over, uh, and he would go this circuit and judge from these various cities, and then he would return to his home in Ramah. Uh, yeah, Ramah Theum Zophim <laughs> is what it says. Uh, but uh, hold on just a minute. Look at verse 19. Uh, this is after the temple encounter and she's prayed for a son. And verse 19 says, They arose early in the morning, worship before the Lord, returned again to their house in Ramah. So, uh, yeah. I, I don't know. I would assume that probably that's the same thing, but I don't know that. <laughs> or, or it, Samuel the Nazarite has to do with a vow you remember Samson was a Nazarite from birth John the Baptist was a Nazarite from birth and I believe Samuel was a Nazarite from birth we'll get to that 
Hang on. All right. So anyway, uh, we we let's back up. Before Samuel is Elkanah. That's his father. Elkanah had two wives, uh, Peninnah and Hannah. Uh, Peninnah had children. Uh, Hannah did not have any children. She had not been able to have them. Each year they would go up to Shiloh to worship. And uh, this was the, where the tabernacle was at this time. And they would go to Shiloh to worship. And when they got there, uh, they would offer up sacrifices. And uh, it says that Elkanah would give extra to Hannah uh, over Peninnah because he loved her. But then Peninnah uh, just tormented Hannah because she didn't have any kids. She made fun of her and she ridiculed her and all kinds of things. And so Hannah was miserable because she didn't have any kids. Now you have to understand in their culture, a woman who could not have kids was pretty much worthless. I mean, she had no value. It'd be like having a bird dog that couldn't hunt. It don't work. Uh, and the reason for having a wife was to have kids. And if she couldn't have any kids, then she would, didn't amount to much. And so it was a very, very big thing for a woman not to be able to have children in this culture. And so Hannah not only dealt, dealt with it in her, in her own mind, but then Peninnah, his other wife, uh, constantly made fun of her and so on and, and made it even worse. Elkanah said, am I not better to you than ten sons? But that didn't do any good. Yeah, it says that he loved her and he, he gave her a double portion when they go up to do the sacrifices. So while they're up there, uh, and, and again, I learned something here because in my mind, if I had told you this story without studying it again, I would have told you that she got up early one morning and was praying and asking God for a son, and it was not. It was in the evening after they had had their meal. It says after they had eat, eaten and drunk that, they, that she was in the area of the tabernacle there, and she was praying and she was asking God to give her a son and she was extremely bitter in her soul and, and not bitter from anger but bitter from in anguish and it says that her mouth was moving but no sound was coming out Eli saw her and he just assumed that this woman is drunk uh, and so he goes to her and he says how long are you going to keep drinking and she said, my Lord, I've not been drinking. I've not had anything to drink. But rather, I am speaking out of anguish and bitterness of soul. And I've, I've asked God to give me a son. And he said, well, the Lord be with you. And may he give you what you've asked for. Uh, in the book, it says that that is a promise from Eli that God's going to give it to her. I don't see that in the wording of it. Uh, it seemed to me more like he just saying, I hope God answers your prayer. Do what? Yeah, I, I think so. I, I, think it, I think he was sincere, but I think he's saying, you know, I hope God really does answer your prayer. I, I'm, I'm pulling for you. I hope, I hope you get what you're praying for. Uh, but, but I don't see it as a promise from God. It may have been, but I, I don't see it as that. But one of the things that she says here is uh, that verse 11 if you'll give your maidservant a son then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life and a razor shall never come on his head and that's why I believe that he was a Nazarite there would have not been any other reason I know of no other explanation for her saying that unless she was saying, I'm dedicating him to God and he will be a Nazarite. No. It doesn't seem to at this point, no. Uh, okay, and, and I said that she told Eli that she was praying for a son, but she did not. She just said, I'm, I've spoken out of great concern and provocation. Uh, and Eli said, Go in peace. May the God of Israel grant your petition that you've asked him. Yeah. Yeah. That would be a, just a, I hope God answers your prayer. I'm, I'm on your side. Uh, 
and, and so Eli does not have any idea what she's prayed for at this point. You're right. Uh, so anyway, they go back home. Early the next morning, they get up. They go back home. says they have relations. And then God answers her prayer and gives her a son. And she told Elkanah after the son was born, she said, I'm going to keep him here in Ramah until he is weaned. After he is weaned, then I will take him to Shiloh, and I will give him to Eli to live there and serve the Lord. So Elkanah said, okay, it's your son. You do as you see best, uh, and, and you can do that. Uh, and so and it does not give us an age, uh, but... Uh, she says, I'm going to wait until he may appear before the Lord and stay there forever, verse 22. And so she stayed home until at some point it said she weaned him. She took him with her, a three-year-old bull, an ephah of flour, and a jug of wine, and brought him to the house of the Lord in Shiloh. It says, although the child was young. And so they offered up the sacrifice. And then she told Eli, she said, uh, I'm the woman who stood here and prayed. And God has granted my request. I prayed for a son, and he has given me my son. And now I'm going to dedicate him to the Lord, uh, and he's going to stay here with you. Now, depending on the translation you have, there in verse 28 uh, of chapter 1, it may say that I have dedicated him to the Lord or it may say, I have given him to the Lord. Or it may say, I have lent him or loaned him to the Lord. Depending on the translation you have. I think the word dedicated probably in our language expresses best her idea. Literally, the word there is lent, L-E-N-T. I've lent him to the Lord. Uh and, and it's interesting because when she was praying, she said, if you give me a son, I will give him to you. I'll give him to the Lord. Now she says, I have lent him to the Lord. So is she backing out on her promise or is she... Okay, she gave him over to the Lord. Yeah, lent, yeah. I don't think there's any discrepancy here again. I think that she just simply is saying, okay, I'm going, I'm, I'm going to give him to the, to the Lord and to the service of the Lord, and he did that. Now then, how old was Samuel at this time? <laughs> he was weaned, okay. Uh, he, he was weaned, and he also was old enough, if you'll notice back there in the passage that I read earlier, uh, Verse 22 said, when he's old enough that he may appear before the Lord and stay there forever. However old that is. Now, to appear before the Lord implies that he's going to serve there in the tabernacle in some way. Uh, and it, in verse 18 it says, Samuel was ministering before the Lord as a boy wearing a linen ephod. Uh, so I don't I don't know how old he was. The Bible doesn't tell us, uh, and and we don't we don't know the answer to that. No, uh -uh. we don't. Yeah, he's old enough to sort of take care of himself to some degree. I think whatever that was, and I don't know. And again, that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this this sort of brings to mind Moses. You know, Moses' mother nursed him to some point, and then she gave him to Pharaoh's daughter. Well, how old was Moses when he went? I don't know how old he was, but he had to have been old enough to have been taught about God and to know something about his background as an Israelite uh, because of what we see in him later and what is said about him in the book of Hebrews. Yeah, but even after uh, Pharaoh's daughter took him, his mother still nursed him and taught him about God. It, it, it doesn't say. No. Oh, 
Huh? Okay, it, she was his nurse, to, but then at some point. Yeah, she got him when he was three months old, and she and she nursed him, but then she turned him over to, uh, I thought. She hired him, hired her as a nurse for a three-month-old baby. Uh, okay, she said, take this child away and nurse him and for me, and I'll give you your wages. And the child grew, verse 10 of chapter 2 of Exodus, the child grew, she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. So it seems that she kept Moses in her own home, took care of him until he got to a certain age, and then carried him to Pharaoh's daughter and said, okay, now he's yours. But he had to have been old enough that he had been taught about God and about the Israelites, or he would not have done the things he did later uh, being brought up as Pharaoh's daughter. He was three months old when she got him not when she turned him back over. She kept him. The mother, Moses' mother, Jochebed, kept Moses for several years, but how many we don't know. And I think the same thing here, that he probably, you know, you talk about him being weaned, and so we think, yeah, okay, you know, he's a year old, or he's six months old, or he's a year and a half old, or whatever, six years old for some, but whatever it is, uh, he he's obviously old enough that he's been taught some things, I think, and he's old enough to work under Eli. What, about Moses? Exodus 2? Yeah. So anyway, that that's just a side note, but that just made me think about it when I, when I started thinking about the age of Samuel. Yeah, no. Yeah. It's, they got, they hired somebody to take care of him probably even after he became Pharaoh's daughter. He probably hired somebody else to take care of him in the palace. That's what I would guess. Uh, and she may have been allowed, another possibility is that she was allowed to see him and visit with him and maybe even help take care of him after he became Pharaoh's daughter. You know, I don't, I don't know, yeah. One of the things about studying the Bible that I have found over the years is you can ask a whole lot more questions than you can find answers to. <laughs> uh, and especially if, you get, if, especially if you're a curious type person uh, because you can you question all this stuff and, and so much of it. And the reason we don't have the answer is because it don't matter. It, it does not make any difference whatsoever other than we know that Samuel was old enough to help minister with Levi around the tabernacle. Uh, now, we see then that uh, the first part of the chapter, first 10 verses uh, of chapter 2 is a song of praise by Hannah, uh, praising God and talking about how wonderful God is. In the verse 11, Elkanah went to his home in Ramah, but the boy ministered to the Lord before Eli the priest. So they went home and left Eli. After that, uh, they had uh, more children. Uh, I believe it was three more sons and two daughters. I believe that's right. Uh, so, so Hannah had, was able to have more children. Now, we change pictures. You know, we've, we've got part one of the play. Now we're ready for part two, uh, act two. Uh, we change the backdrop, we change the scene. We're at Shiloh. Now, uh, Eli is the priest, and Eli has two sons, Hophni and Phinehas. Hophni and Phinehas, it says, were worthless men. And interestingly, the literal translation there is they were sons of Belial. In other words, they were sons of the devil, is how they are described. And, and so it's translated, they're worthless men. 
it begins to tell about some of the things that they do. And the main thing that it tells about here that they did that was so bad was in what they were doing with the sacrifices. When somebody offered up a sacrifice, the law provided that once the meat had cooked to a certain point, and it had to cook over the fire, and I think sometimes they boiled it first and then cooked it over the fire, uh, the fat had to all burn up, and there were some other things that had to be done. And when that was done, then the priest had a three-pronged hook and he could reach in the, to the sacrifice and get out whatever came out with that hook, and he could keep that for his family to eat. He couldn't go back a second, a second helping. He got one shot, and whatever he got is what he could eat. Well, in boiling it before they put it on the fire, obviously it was still one big chunk, and Eli's sons would go a lot of times when people were just boiling it, getting ready to sacrifice, and say, we want that. Or they'd take the three-pronged hook and get it out of the boiling water. Of course, they'd get the whole piece of meat. And if somebody protested, they said, you either give it to us or we're going to take it away from you. So, you know, we, you don't have any choice. And they would, when they did put it on the fire to roast it, they wouldn't wait until the fat was burned up, and they would get it while it was still uh, not completely done, uh, and and they would you know they would get more of it that way, and God condemns them for despising His sacrifices. What they're doing is a not only a flagrant violation of the law of Moses, but it was a total disregard for that sacrifice. Now, the sacrifice belonged to who? It belonged to God. And they were stealing from God what belonged to Him. So, I mean, this is, this is why they're referred to as sons of Belial, sons of the devil, because they were actually stealing from God. And they were Levites, they were priests, they had been taught better, they knew all the rules and the regulations, they knew why. And yet they totally rejected that for their own personal benefit. And so we, we find that, that God is, it says, verse 17, Thus the sin of the young men was very great before the Lord, for the men despised the offering of the Lord. And so this is the crux of the matter. Now, we also find later on that it says, uh, that they were laying with the women who served at the doorway of the tent of meeting. So they were not only stealing the sacrifices to God, but they were committing immoralities with the women that worked around the tabernacle. And again, my guess is, given their culture and given what we know about their situation, the women not, did not necessarily have a choice in the matter. Uh, and, and so uh, and it says that just a little insert here verse 18 of chapter 2 Samuel was ministering before the Lord as a boy wearing a linen ephod his mother would make him a little robe and bring it to him each year when she came up for the sacrifice and Eli would bless Elkanah and his wife and uh, pray that God would give them more children so uh, and then here's where it says that she conceived, had gave birth to three sons and two daughters. I am assuming that the three sons is three additional sons, not including Samuel, uh, although the wording could be such that it, that includes Samuel, but I, I think it probably does not. Now then, verse 22, Eli was very old. He heard all that his sons were doing, and uh, all the immoralities they were committing. And so he called his sons in. He says, why are you doing these things? You know it's not right. Uh, and if you sin against a man, that's one thing. But what you're doing is sinning against God. Uh, and he, he says they would not listen. So the Lord desired to put them to death. 
And then verse 26, and the boy Samuel was growing in stature and favor with both the Lord and with men. Who else is that statement made about? Jesus, okay. Remember after the, the, his event at the temple when he was 12 years old and he went back home and it says and he grew in stature and wisdom and favor with God and man. So anyway, I thought that was sort of interesting that that statement is made about Samuel. Now, then verse 25 at the end of it is the New American Standard says but they would not listen to the voice of their father for the Lord desired to put them to death what does some other translation say in that last sentence there okay before that the rest of that sentence They didn't heed the voice of the Father. Does anybody have something else there? Verse 25, chapter 2, verse 25. Okay, did not listen to the Father's rebuke. Okay, I was thinking there was one translation that used that word. It said they did not listen to their Father's rebuke. Uh, and just stick that in the back of your head and let's move on. All right. Uh, then a man of God came to Eli. Who is a man of God? What would we normally refer to that as? A prophet. Okay. This is an interesting statement to me because what this tells me is God has had prophets all through the ages. And we think of prophets and we think, you know, they're limited. You know, you got Elijah, you got Elisha, you got, you know, you got this one, you got that one. But the fact is, there are several unnamed prophets throughout Scripture. And then you have places where it mentions the, the school of the prophets and talks about the 50 prophets that were hidden. It talks about, you know, lots and lots of prophets. And so God has always had a lot of people that are speaking His Word and trying to convince people to live for Him and serve Him. And so this prophet comes to Eli and, and he says... To him, he says, thus says the Lord. And basically what he says is, look, I chose your family to be priest and to serve before the Lord. And, and I promised that your family would keep doing this. But because of the wickedness of your sons and because you have not uh, restrained them, uh, he said, then... Look at verse 29. Why do you kick at my sacrifice and my offering which I commanded in my dwelling and honor your sons above me by making yourselves fat with the choicest of every offering of my people of Israel? Uh, and so that's the prophet talking to Eli. Yeah. That's the prophet talking to Eli. Uh, and, and he said, yes, I made a promise that I would Keep it in your family, however far be it from me. For those who honor me, I will honor, and those who despise me will be lightly esteemed. And he says, I'm going to break your strength, the strength of your father's house. There's not going to be any old men after you in your house. They're going to die young. Uh, and I'll raise up for myself a faithful priest. In verse 35, back up in verse 34, he said, uh, that uh, the sign will be that Hophni and Phinehas will die on the same day and you'll know that this is the word of the Lord uh, and yeah yeah all your descendants will die, die in the prime of their life that's yeah none of them's going to be old they, none of them's going to live any amount of time at all uh, so God places this announcement on Eli and says this is exactly what's going to happen uh, and he said your descendants will be begging the other priest for a loaf of bread just to have food to eat so he, he really is, tells Eli exactly what's going to happen now again another story again we don't know at what point this is or how old uh, Samuel is but Samuel 
was ministering before the Lord. And it says, the word of the Lord was rare in those days, did not come very often. And Samuel and Eli had laid down to go to sleep, seemingly in, in the tabernacle or somewhere right surrounding the tabernacle, it, it seems like. And uh, the Lord spoke to, to Samuel, and he said, Samuel, Samuel. And so Samuel thought it was Eli, and he jumped up and ran to the room where Eli was, and he he said, here I am. And he said, I can call you. Go back to bed. So he went back to bed, and the video heard, Samuel, Samuel. And he jumped up and ran back to Eli again. And, and Samuel said, Eli said, Samuel, I didn't call you. You go back to bed. So it happened a third time. Well, the third time it dawned on Eli, this must be God talking to Samuel. He said, if it happens again, you say, speak, Lord, your servant's listening. And so Samuel goes back and lays down. Sure enough, in a little bit it says, The Lord appeared and stood before him and said, Samuel, Samuel. And he said, Speak, uh, Lord, your servant is listening. And so he told Samuel what he was going to do to Eli's family and that he was going to kill all of them. Uh, and so... He said, I'm going to carry it out against, uh, he said, Behold, I'm about to do a thing in Israel at which both ears of everyone who hears it will tingle. And he says, this is what I'm going to do. Uh, and he said, I'm going to carry out against Eli what I told him. Uh, and because of the iniquity of Eli's house shall be atoned for by sacrifice or offering forever. Robert, yeah. Uh, it says in verse 3, 1 there, now the boy Samuel ministered to the Lord for Eli, and the word of the Lord was rare in those days. There was no widespread revelation. Yeah. Is, is this a, a period of silence? No. Not necessarily. It just wasn't very often that God spoke to anybody. No. I mean, it obviously was a period of silence, but I don't know how long it was. It, it may have been for a year, two years, or five years or something. It's not like... It's not like the 400 years of silence between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Uh, they didn't have yeah, they didn't have any. Well, they had the law of Moses written, but just one copy as far as I know. Uh, and it was in the, the ark in the tabernacle. So, Yeah, most of them, yeah. So anyway, it was, uh, but, but for whatever reason, God didn't appear to a people real often. Uh, but now he appears to, to Samuel. Well, the next morning, Eli said, Okay, Samuel, tell me what, what the Lord said. And, and he said, uh, Tell him everything that the word of the Lord said to him. Uh, and he said, uh, May God do to you also and more also if you hide anything from me. And so Samuel told him everything uh, wait a minute. In verse 15, this is what I was going to say. It says, "But Samuel was afraid to tell the vision to Eli." And I thought that was interesting that it's referred to as a vision. Uh, it says back up earlier that the Lord stood before him and spoke to him. And then it refers to it as a vision. Uh, and, and so, I mean, he saw, he saw the Lord speaking to him, but, you know, was he really there? I don't know. Do what? He wouldn't have been there in body. Yeah, I don't, probably you know, I, not. I mean, I, yeah, probably not in any physical form, but it says that he appeared there. So he, he, he at least saw him, whether it was real or not. So it was a vision, he says. But anyway, he told him exactly what was going, what, the Lord had told him that he was going to kill them and they were going to be destroyed. And uh, Eli said, it is the Lord. Let him do what seems good to him. Uh, and then all Israel from Dan, even to Beersheba, knew that Samuel was confirmed as a prophet of the Lord. And the Lord appeared again at Shiloh because the Lord revealed himself to Samuel at Shiloh by the word of the Lord. So from this point on, we, we see that the Lord does appear to Samuel seemingly quite frequently uh, to talk to him and tell him what's going on and, and give him instructions. I have no idea. 
I, I've, I had wondered, but I, I don't know anything. I mean, it tells us how old Eli is when he died, but how old was he earlier? You know, we don't know. It doesn't say. Yeah. Yeah. It, well, it, it, and when he dies, he's 98 years old. So, uh, you know, it, it, what? Huh? Eli was 98 when he dies. Yeah. He was fat, he was old, and he was blind. And he fell off of a stool and broke his neck. All right, we will stop right there and pick up with chapter 4 next week, Lord willing. several passages that I did. I, I read the New York Standard and the English Standard and I read the New King James and some of them. That's what I was talking about. About 33 said, and the King James said, and that was a part of the CSV says, and that was a part of the CSV says, and that there, there's several translations. There are three times that there's words in there and how they're translating have a completely different meaning. That's, that's one of them, but there's some others too that we'll see. I knew you had to write over it. I'm taking it out. You are beautiful beyond description.
Good evening. Glad to see everybody out this evening. Um, if you will, turn with me to number 784. I think Eric's going to put it on the overhead, but I want to read all three of these verses, and it goes along with what I want to have to say tonight. First verse is, Why did my Savior come to earth and to a humble go? Why did he choose a lowly birth? 
because he loved me so? Why did he drink the bitter cup of sorrow, pain, and woe? Why on the cross be lifted up? Because he loved me so. Till Jesus comes, I'll sing his praise, and then to glory go, and reign with him through endless days, because he loved me so. He loved me so, he loved me so. He gave his precious life for me, for me, because he loved me so. We all know that in Genesis, God created mankind, and it wasn't shortly after that that mankind separated himself from God because he did what God told him not to do. And God had a plan whenever this happened. Um, he knew that man was going to mess up, and he had this plan in order even from the get-go. But he had a plan to get man back to God. And he loved us, and this, this song is saying, why did he do it? Because he loved us so much so that we could have hope of heaven. And in 1 John three sixteen. It says, by this we know love because he laid down his life for us. And also in 1 John 4 verse 10 it says, In this is love, not, we, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. That means that we had to have somebody stand in our place. And that was Jesus. God loved us so much that He sent His only Son to stand in our place to be atonement for our sins because the blood of bulls and goats weren't good enough. And we're commanded to love like God, but I want to make a statement here that if you're not a Christian, you don't love like God. You actually hate God because you're against Him. And I, I, that's blunt, but you have to realize that if you're not with God, you're against God. And in Romans 5, verse 8. It says, But God demonstrates His own love towards us, that in while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Some translations say, while we were still enemies you think about that that we were God's enemies but yet he loved us so much he sent his only begotten son so that we could have hope tonight if you're not a Christian why stand against God why don't you stand with God why, why be God's enemy whenever you can be with God and be in love like God does if you are a Christian and you uh, have struggled with this that you've fallen away and you need the prayers of the saints come forward there's no better time than right now to get your life right as we stand and sing oh do not let the work depart and close thy eyes again.
given her address. If you would like it uh, given to me, you can send her a card. But remember, she'll only be there for two weeks, so uh, uh, that's the plan. So uh, if you want to send her a card, I suggest doing it this week for sure. The way our mail service has been, it may not get there in time if you go much later. Any other announcements? That Joel, you I got a text from Doris today, and she said that she wanted me to tell everybody thank you for remembering her and praying for her and keep praying and so there you go. we'll pass that on uh shirley long had colon surgery on monday uh, surgery went well uh, uh sheree said last night that she is still in a lot of pain but they are controlling the medication and having had that myself it is painful <laughs> but she's oh. doing as well as can be yeah a dear friend of mine and a, a fellow rap builder Ian Carter was in a motorcycle accident Saturday and has serious injuries. Let's keep him in the prayer. He's at home, but he has serious injuries. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Joe Polk's Uncle George passed away uh, earlier today, I believe, on his mama's side. So that's why he's not here. Yeah. yeah. He's sick too. He's sick too. So we've got a lot going on, and we need to remember each of them, not only in our prayers, but anything that we can do for them. Is there anything else? Uh, Brother Jacob Fudge, would you lead us in our closing prayer? We'll dismiss. Father in heaven, we thank you for this wonderful day. You give us odd and many wonderful blessings. We thank you for the food we eat, the clothing on our back, and roofs over here. Thank you for the rain and sunshine that you have on the palms, Lord. Please be with the people that were mentioned this night. May they be restored to full health. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. If we don't need the, to register another I car. I just think the refrigerator and the microwave and that shelving unit. Just put all the, just, just get his. Easier. Easier. I just thought it would be easier. I don't know if they're, if they're allowed trucks on my car. They were. Don't have brakes. Okay, all right. It's not like we can rent a U-Haul and just put all the. We can rent a U-Haul truck. No. <laughs> you can't pull it into the parking lot. I mean, to move in, you can't. Well, it'd block it. Yeah, it'd block it. It'd block it. block off the lot. Is that all? Moving inside. There's probably not a weird problem here. Well, if you go sit down there, make sure you don't see me up in front of it. Because I won't be turning around. I wouldn't take you more. 